Merry Christmas everybody! I hope you're having a fantastic time celebrating the festivities with friends and family alike. And even if you don't celebrate Christmas, I hope you're having a great day in general. It's finally here, ladies and gentlemen, the video you've all been waiting for. The review of Thomas and Friends' unsuccessful but bold sister series, Tugs. This is a video that has been in the works for a while, and it's actually thanks to you guys that it exists in the first place. Back towards the end of June of this year, I set a milestone for myself, that if my channel reached 2000 subscribers, I would make a review on Tugs. I was unsure if I wanted to do it or not because of other various videos that looked into the series and I didn't know what I could bring to the table to give, you know, my unique spin. So the milestone was my way of seeing if people wanted me to review it or not. About a month later, right after my friends and I went to the Audrey Extravaganza in Wales, my channel finally hit the milestone. And after various other videos I wanted to finish first, plus a few other things going on, I finally held a watch party with my friends that I went to Wales with, where we all watched the series from start to finish for the first time. And now, after a long time in the works since that teaser I posted at the start of September, the review is finally here. Today, I will be talking about how Tugs was made, the stories it had to offer, the characters, the production standouts and the aftermath, briefly ranking each story from worst to best, before finally answering a big question to wrap everything up. Asking myself, is this show better than Thomas and Friends? I hope that you're ready because it's time for one last big video to wrap up this crazy year of 2022. This is Tugs. The year was 1986. Executive producer Britt Allcroft and director David Mitten, as well as the rest of the working members of Clearwater Features, had wrapped up series 2 of Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends. The show was seeing success, Wilbert Audrey gave his approval on what they had done, everything was going well. The show would then go on a bit of a break for a while, as Britt and David each ventured off to try out different things. Brit went to America with TV producer Rick Sigelkow to try and market Thomas in the States. Go watch my Magic Railroad review, it will explain everything. 
while David and producer Robert D. Cardona stayed at Shepperton Studios with Clearwater Features to start their own original model series, where instead of talking trains, the show was going to be about talking boats. The show, Tugs, was put into production. David and Robert wanted to push the boundaries of what they had accomplished with Thomas and Friends. The length of the episodes was one thing, as they wanted to go from creating 26 episodes of four and a half minutes to 13 episodes that were going to be half an hour, Jesus Christ. They supposedly wrote the scripts for this 30 minute format, but were requested by the higher ups to cut it down to 20 minutes during filming, and then further cut down to 15 minutes. Because the episodes were much longer in length and thus took more time to film, on top of expenses with the props themselves, the running water and the pyrotechnics for fiery explosions, this was a show that just ate money, like it just consumed it. David and Robert were determined for the show to gain an American audience and so wanted the show to be a home run success here in the UK. In an attempt to get some of the money back, four of the 20 minute episodes were released straight to VHS in 1988 with the full set of 13 15 minute episodes airing in 1989 on ITV. Unfortunately, due to the short time on air without gaining American investors, the show not making enough money back, and even lawsuits against the show claiming it had stolen ideas, Clearwater's main source of funding, Television South, declared bankruptcy that same year, and with no money to cover their losses, Clearwater Features closed down in 1990. Thus, despite a second series pre-planned, Tugs was over. David and the rest of the Clearwater crew began working under Britt Allcroft as part of her own company, the Britt Allcroft Company. Thanks to Thomas's success in America with Shining Time Station and the success in Japan that allowed them to gain funding from Fuji TV, Series 3 was greenlit and they jumped right back into working with the Sodor sets and engine props we know and love like putting on a pair of cosy slippers famously using background boat props and running water effects that they had learned how to work with on tugs, as well as different weather effects, different times of day, and a large amount of stories that just took place by the sea. Series 3 of Thomas the Tank Engine saw its release in 1991 and 1992, and despite having some minor controversies, they showed a lamentable ignorance of Rule 55. It was a success across the globe, and the franchise would continue on as a result. The only member who didn't return to working on Thomas and Friends was Robert D. Cardona. He still had an ambition for a tugboat series and was not about to give up so easily in spite of everything that had happened. He moved to Canada and was hired as a director of another boat series, Theodore Tugboat. This show also applied what was learned on filming tugs and was more successful, airing from 1993 to 2001. I might just give this show a look-see in the future. Its roots are connected to Thomas, so I just have to know about it. Plus, I'm sure there won't be too many episodes to look at. Christ on a bike. There was also Salty's Lighthouse, which was an attempt, quote unquote, to bring Tugs into the States in 1997. But I only saw a little bit of it in Unlucky Tugs video and just... Just no. Tug's release was extremely brief and never had the chance to grow with its stories and characters, but those they did get to show have stood the test of time and even to this day have several people across the globe looking into what might have been and behind the scenes information previously lost to time. Why did this show resonate with so many people so many years later? Let's find out. Tugs is set around the big, busy, bustling harbour of Big City Port. Taking place during the 1920s, it's the glory days of steam-powered tugboats. The harbour is operated by two rival fleets of tugboats, each managed by their own captain. The friendly and hard-working Star Tugs, managed by Captain Star, who also acts as the narrator, remembering these stories from his past, and the nasty, scheming Z-Stacks, managed by Captain Zero. Throughout the series, we follow their daily jobs as they compete for contracts in the harbour, the side characters they interact with or meet for the first time, and the daily incidents that cause either a minor inconvenience like a barge of rocks spilling into the sea, or being held hostage. Woo! 
Ooh, mood whiplash! Each episode focuses on an important job needing to be completed or an obstacle to overcome, fitting the standard storytelling layout that we're used to in most fiction. The equilibrium, the introduction to the characters we're going to follow, the environment they're working in and their goals. The disequilibrium, the obstacle presents itself which puts a stop towards them achieving their goals. And the new equilibrium, where the obstacle is overcome and the goals are met, even if it sometimes wasn't entirely what they intended. The episode that I think showcases this layout the best, and perfectly describes what kind of world you're getting into with this show, is its very first episode, Sunshine. We're given a brief introduction to the big city port, the time it's set in, and each of the star tugs, as well as their jobs for the day which are preparing to bring the ocean liner, the Duchess, into port, and that a new switcher boat, Sunshine, will be coming from upriver to help them with the workload. Then we're given a foreshadowing of the disequilibrium, as Captain Zero instructs the Z-Stacks to sabotage the Star Tug's attempt to bring in the Duchess, so they can send in one of their own fleets to help out and earn part of the contract. After going around the port and bumping into various characters, Tencent's find Sunshine when he arrives, and the two deliver fuel to Sally's seaplane. With the world introduced, the story of the episode established, and the sign of bad things to come foreshadowed, we conclude Act 1. The Z-Stack's plan of sabotage begins, with Zip and Zug pushing Big Mac onto ground as the Duchess arrives, so there's no choice but for Tencent and Sunshine to take his place in helping the others. Then as they start to bring her in, Zorin secretly pushes Sunshine into her, causing her to rock out of control. Zorin pretends to be the hero and helps the Star Tugs out. He is congratulated by Captain Zero, and as the fireworks go off above the Duchess that night, Sunshine runs away in shame, thinking nobody will want to talk to him anymore. But Tencent ventures out into the night to try and find him, and try and cheer him up. So, with the disequilibrium of the Z-Stack's sabotage, a character affected by the change, with Sunshine going from being happy-go-lucky to down in the dumps, and the beginning of one of the good guys, Tencent, trying to put things right, thus ends Act 2. Tencent ventures out into the mist-coated big city port looking for Sunshine. He bumps into Izzy Gomez the Tramp Steamer, who tells him what really happened with the Duchess as he saw Zorin push Sunshine, giving Tencent extra incentive to find him. He tells the truth to the rest of the Star Tugs, and they rally a search party. They eventually find Sunshine run aground and still upset, but he brightens up immediately when he finds out the accident wasn't his fault. The next day, Zorin is shouted at by Captain Zero for being spotted and losing the contract, and Captain Star reprimands the Star Tugs, excluding Tencent, for jumping to conclusions. All ending with welcoming Sunshine and now painted in their colours as he is now an official member of the Star Tugs. So now with a resolution of clearing Sunshine's name, the bad guy's plan failing, and a new equilibrium with Sunshine adjoining the fleet, thus ends Act 3, and the episode story. Each act is easy to establish, and thus gives a solid example of what story structure to expect from the show. That is definitely something the show excels at. However, in order to meet the three act structure, this episode, and a couple of other episodes for that matter, do suffer from pacing issues. The scene where Tencent goes around the ports looking for sunshine feels like it really goes on for a little bit. But every scene in the episode up to this point felt like it lasted as long as it needed to. No needless dragging out for the sake of meeting the 20 minute runtime. But then you get to this point? And I don't know, it's the one point in the episode where I feel like it slows down. Which seems silly to point out given its actual length, but there's no other way I can describe it. And again, this pacing issue also applies to other episodes. Warrior spends quite a amount of time in the beginning just focusing on Warrior floating around and having his barge bump into himself, and Quarantine despite having two different plots going on at the same time with OJ's engine suffering in the heatwave and the infected ships staying in quarantine, has the problem where we see OJ accidentally sinking the Fulton Ferry in the first half, but then the second half is focused on what feels like less eventful quarantine work. Thankfully, episodes like Munitions, Trapped and High Tide make up for it with much better pacing in their storytelling. Munitions has what should be one long action sequence of the dockside going up in flames, but feels like it keeps on building and building on top of itself before the Krakatoa Tramper finally sinks. Trapped has just the right amount of time focused on the comedy of trying to move an old tramper from blocking the river, with a very funny ending that feels earned. 
and high tide has just the right amount of build up to the breaking of the rail bridge and the intensity of trying to fix it before the trains run over it. Even episodes with OK pacing like Regatta, or 4th of July for American audiences, make up for the poorer pacing of other episodes. It's another story with two different plots going on, with Grampus the submarine saving Lily Lightship, and then the tugs banding together to save him from being blown up in target practice. Y yeah, I'll come back to that. But it feels like one plot naturally leads into another, which makes the story feel... kind of complete. I'll talk more about the pacing when I get to the production segments with their different length cuts, but for now, I'll say the pacing of the series' episodes was overall pretty good. Far from perfect, but good enough. With different jobs and different story beats centred around these jobs comes the experimentation of tone. Each story has a tone that is unique to that episode and that episode only. It, it can be funny, it can be spooky, bombastic, suspenseful, triumphant. Depending on what order you watch the episodes, let's say you watch them in their broadcast order, You'll go from the generally laid-back, warm, welcome sunshine, watching the rest of the Tugs introducing him to life in the big city, to the mystery-solving intensity of Pirate, trying to find out who is stealing the barges from Big City and whether or not said thief Sea Rogue can save his uncle from being sunk. On the other hand, you could go from the bone-chilling spooks and scares of ghosts as the Tugs start to see ghostly-looking boats roaming the seas at night, to the wacky comedy hijinks of Jinxed, as the Tugs try to work with a Jinxed tugboat causing bad luck across the harbour. Watching these episodes all in a row, you'll never know what's around the bend. Unless you read the episode titles. Yeah, they really thought out of the box with these names, didn't they? An episode where we see ghost ships and spooky apparitions around a big city, what do we call it? Ghosts. Oh, what a genius. To be fair, it's not like a lot of the Thomas stories, both before and after Tugs was released, were any better. Like a story where Henry is having problems with coal. What should we call it? Coal. Perfection. While the experimentation with tone allows for each story to stand out on its own, there is an issue with it. I joked about it earlier, but the fact remains that jumping from tone to tone can create a severe mood whiplash. Episodes like Warrior, where the biggest problems they face are Warrior tipping a barge of rocks into the ocean and then they all have to prevent Izzy Gomez from tipping over into the water. Leads into High Tide, where Top Hat has to rescue trains heading to certain doom with a broken bridge. Furthermore, the episode before Warrior, Munitions, has the tugboats banding together to try and stop the spread of the munitions fire. I'm finding it hard to describe this, but the tone just seems so back and forth. Certain episodes feel one in the same with their tones, like, I can certainly see episodes like Munitions and High Tide paired up with each other, or Sunshine and Quarantine. The latter pair feel like they're more of a laid-back but still dramatic series, while the former feel like they're of a more intense, grittier series. Uh, am I making sense? I hope I am, otherwise I'll just sound like a nitpicking snob. The shift in tone is fine for the Tugs universe, and if you watch the episodes separate from each other, then it becomes less noticeable. But if you watch it all in order, like I did for the first time, yeah, it's just an issue I had to address. Which, that leads me on to one final gripe that I have with the stories of Tugs, which might get me a lot of controversy. The attempt at realism is rather questionable. Now before you say anything, I know, I know, I know, and I know. This is a world with sentient talking tugboats. So on the surface, because <laughs> they're boats, taking realism into consideration seems like a waste of time. And you know what? You can always just not think 100% about how the universe works and just enjoy it for what it presents. But I can do it with Thomas and friends, why can't I do it with Tugs? The answer is actually quite simple. The world of Thomas, both the show and the books they're based on, are also based around sentient talking machines, those being trains, cars, buses, lorries, helicopters, etc. But the fact that they are sentient is literally the only thing that stands out in the universe. They were still machines that could not operate without their drivers. More so in the books. You saw what was a realistic universe similar to our own from their perspective. 
and how they interact with each other in certain circumstances related to being a train. Like how do trains react to coming off the rails? How do trains react to being given a job they don't like? How does each personality of the trains clash with the others? The fact they had faces in the first place was almost trivial as they were just normal trains. Even if they did have some level of control like being able to stop in place and struggling to actively pull a train, you could argue that's just the inner machinations of a normal train and the crew just trying to work with it. It just so happens that they have faces for establishing that human connection and again, create a unique perspective on the world that they are in. Not everything made sense, but enough of it did so that you could read the books and watch the show without being confused. Most of the time. Tugs, on the other hand, tries to have its cake and eat it too. The tugboats can drive themselves around and so drivers, or in this case captains, are not needed. But we have the presence of Captain Star and Captain Zero who, while we never see their faces as they give orders from their offices using a megaphone, it's fairly obvious that they're humans. And so with the presence of humans surrounded by self-driving tugboats, comes a bunch of questions on how the tugs are able to accomplish things without humans. How do the tugs attach and detach themselves from the ropes on their barges? How do the villain boats in Pirate manage to carry these sheets to cover up Lily Lightship and this boy? Speaking of, Sea Rogue is trying to save his uncle, but how is he an uncle? How do the tug's genetics work? How does Izzy pay for being towed into the harbour? Do boats have currency? How do they store it? The steam engines around the ports are sentient, but they have open cabs. Do they need drivers to open their regulators so they can operate? If so, then why don't the tugs have drivers that need to turn their engines on? How does Billy Shoepack light the fuse of his dynamite? I know it all sounds like pointless questions for the tug universe, besides, not every confusing moment is directly addressed in the show, but if they kind of establish that humans are a thing in this universe with sentient self-driving vehicles, those are questions I am going to ask. There is a big difference between suspending belief and unanswered logic. While Thomas leans more towards the suspending disbelief with only a few moments of questionable logic, Tugs is somewhere in the middle. There is enough realism within its universe that I can comfortably watch an episode, but there are glaring issues that sit with me both during and after I've watched one. It just throws me for a loop seeing these heavily realistic looking tugboats follow what's essentially cartoon logic. In my opinion, you can have it one of two ways. Either the universe is set where the sentient machines have their own society without humans like Pixar's cars, where everything that would normally be done with hands has a reasonable explanation, or a universe where humans drive the boats and are seen working around the harbour operating jobs that can only be accomplished by hand, like in Thomas. The latter option would be very complicated as it would need to have way too many driver characters for each boat and the other vehicles in the show so I can't see why they didn't go for that option, but I feel like there would have been way more consistency. Therefore, and I'm sorry to have to say this, but I don't think these stories are as good as the ones in Thomas and Friends. They are still fantastically written with nice pacing and great with mixing different tones, but I just think they lack in comparison to the big old talking train show that had better consistency in tone and realism as well as having better pacing in severely less time than their episode lengths. The stories in Tugs are far from outstanding as a whole, but not bad by any means. One of the most defining factors of the Tugs series is how standout the characters are. Let's begin with who can be defined as the main characters of the series, the Star Tugs. Starting with who could be seen as the show's audience stand-in character somewhat, Ten Cents. He's a small switcher tug, used for hauling barges and odd jobs around at the city port. He's brave, determined, hot-headed and cheeky. Sunshine! Only good for day work is here. Might brighten you up a bit, top hat. <laughs> I resent that! Settle down. Almost like another main character in a TV series about anthropomorphic vehicles I know. He's usually one to go headfirst into dangerous tasks regardless if he's prepared or not. Like in Munitions when he boldly takes the fuel barge out to sea before the flames cause it to explode. And in Sunshine when he and Sunshine go in to assist the others in towing the Duchess into port. 
Sometimes his hot-headed nature can lead him to nearly causing problems, like in Quarantine when he races Zorin to an infected ship, and is only stopped by OJ's engine breaking down. But he means well by his actions, and always tries his best no matter the circumstance. Next we have his best friend, Sunshine. He too was a switcher tug, and acts as the new character for the series in the opening episode. He is also known to be cheeky towards other tugs, but he's also a level-headed guy and follows the job orders with little complaint. So in that regard you can kind of see him as The Rock, trying to keep Tencent's from being too reckless. Like how he insists to Tencent's to get away from the fuel barge in munitions despite his heroic intentions. Hey, what you've got there looks far more dangerous than me! That's a bomb, man! Just leave it, will ya? But that doesn't mean he's not one for getting accidentally into dangerous situations like getting caught in a pile of logs in upriver, yet somehow still manages to be optimistic and witty about it. <coughs> Don't worry, I'm okay. The smoke from me stack seems a bit heavy, though. I'm afraid that smoke's not coming from your stack. No, I, uh, I didn't think it actually was. He also occasionally speaks with a whistle between his teeth, and whenever it happens, it's honestly kind of adorable. Right, I'll go back up river for help. Cranes are, are something. Well, he, he could have seen something. I'm sure Captain Star believes you. Yes, sir! Hello, Sally. The fact that nobody brings it up in conversation adds to its charm. Now on to the bigger boats, starting with who's basically the cool guy in the office workspace, Hercules. He's an ocean-going tug who's put in charge of big important jobs around the dock. The most important jobs being guiding large vessels into ports from far out across the open waters, like Krakatoa in munitions or the SS Vienna in Big Freeze. He is the most level-headed and coolest of the Starfleet, Everyone respects Hercules, even the Z-Stacks. They know whenever he's nearby to play it cool and not act like thugs. He is so cool, he calls everybody sweetheart, darling, and Medeas with complete confidence. Ghosts? What's that about Medeas, hmm? Well done, old darlings. Attention, nothing. I'm finished here, old darling. Moving out. Hey, no, you don't. Not allowed to check things out. Check all you like, sweetheart. I'm needed elsewhere. Not much else to say about him, to be honest, but that doesn't make him a bad character. He's a great one, just not one that we see often as he's usually out on important jobs. The next two are the Harbour Tugs, Big Mac and Warrior. Big Mac is the gruff and tough muscle of the fleet, and can often come off as rude, but he is still a valuable member of the team and is one of the most calm and strategic when trying to solve a problem. Like in Regatta when he promises to look after the barges whilst the Starfleets try to come up with a plan to save Grampus, or upriver when he runs into the pile of logs over and over to try and get sunshine out. He also shares a close brotherly bond with Warrior. Unlike Big Mac, Warrior is the more… simple-minded muscle of the fleet. He has both a heart of gold and the strength to take on big jobs, but he's not very bright, and can be quite clumsy. Hey, job eh? Something's going on over there. I'll take a look. Warrior! Warrior! Watch that! Blah! Well, gotta go now. Bye! Uh, congratulations there, Warrior! Oh, well, dear, dear me, hey, little ditcher, are, are you all right, eh? <laughs> but despite his little accidents, he's proven in several episodes to be the hero of the day. In munitions, he rushes in to stop the fire from spreading and refuses to move back so he can save the dockside engine puffer. Move back, warrior, move back! No, sir, I couldn't look after puffer. He's a mighty valuable and good friend. Got to look after your friends, you know. In his titular episode, Warrior, he's the main source of strength behind pushing Izzy Gomez off the rocks. In Upriver, he gets the idea to create a barrier of barges to stop the out of control flow of logs heading down the river. And even though he ends up on the wrong side, he is still able to push the entire flood out of the way into a disused warehouse and saves Uptown. We also get both his figurative and literal shining moment in the series finale, Big Freeze. The situation is that Hercules is bringing the SS Vienna into port, but Lily Lightship has no fuel left. So after a lot of complications and trying to come up with ideas, Warrior gets the idea to light his garbage barge on fire as a substitute light source, and it does work. 
Even when the fire goes out and the fleet struggle to turn on the replacement light barge, Warrior accidentally bumps into it and it starts working. Ten cents, sunshine, what's the problem? Oops. Oh, Warrior! Well, I thought a good fun might make it come on. He's the one everyone sees as a dumb oaf at the start of the series, but has the most moments of heroism throughout the series that prove his worth. Without a doubt, he's my favourite character from the Starfleet. Now for the fan favourite railway tug, Top Hat. If his monocle, top hat, and facial expressions weren't already a giveaway, he's a massive snob. He likes to keep his image, hold himself in a position far above the others, and never misses an opportunity to give a snooty comment about one of his crewmates or a job he's been given. The Gordon or James of the group, you could say. Well, I have seen ghosts. What? You seen what? Right, leave it to me. None of you move. Anyone going to move? I'm not going to move. Do I have to earn a living with this motley crew? You know, it never fails to amaze me. Every day I see something new. Today it's the sight of a floating sack of coal, no less. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder he's everyone's favourite. He still does work hard in everything he does like the rest of his friends. He just always has something to say about it. But in the right circumstances, when the port is in danger from something like logs floating down a river or a huge tramper is about to topple over, without hesitation he is ready to help. This determination is best showcased in his standout episode, High Tide. My load is wider! Where he saves two steam engines from a collapsing bridge, all without showing off. The perfect way to show his heroic side is when there's no crowd to show off to. Proving deep down he really is a good guy. His prop is also one of the most unique and funniest of the main cast, as his wheelhouse can grow like an extending neck. <laughs> Which I think they only really found useful in the episode Trapped. Anybody that side? Oh, I say hello! Moving swiftly on, let's talk about OJ. He is a paddle steamer tug, and as the oldest of the fleet, he is the one with the most experience. He's given odd jobs around Big City as well, but he's often limited to what he can do due to his age. But he is still young at heart, and will dash into action to help his friends. Like how he blew out his old failing engine to stop Tencent from going near an infected ship. He'll also tell anyone off who doesn't follow common sense instructions that he knows are the safest way to work. In munitions, he tells the Navy tug Blue Nose not to get in the way of unloading munitions. Even one of the Z-Stacks, Zorin, sticks up for him. You shouldn't move a barge that's being unloaded. Get pension off, old timer. This is my pool, eh? See what goes. Nah. Go and draw your pension, OJ. You bastard. <laughs> Shut it, the panel is right. We're not moving that barge, mister. There's not many other character moments I can recall that were stand out to me from OJ, so instead, here's an interesting fact. OJ's design was directly based off of the famous paddle wheel tugboat, Eppleton Hall, a boat that worked on the River Tyne in Newcastle, England from 1914 to 1967. She was going to be sold for scrap, but was instead restored by the director of the San Francisco Maritime Museum at the time, Carl Cortum, and after several complications and planning, was driven across the sea from Newcastle all the way to Hyde Street Pier in San Francisco, where she still resides to this day. I highly, highly recommend you watch the Unlucky Tugs video covering the complete history of how she was saved and her six-month voyage. It makes OJ's design and presence in the show all the more wholesome. Last but not least, we have the ex-military submarine, Grampus. After he's set up to be blown up in target practice when he's deemed out of date by the Navy, he's purchased and becomes the Starfleet's eighth member. He's cheeky, but still dedicates himself to working his hardest, and normally gets himself into dangerous scenarios. Like how he finds the warehouse of the mystery tug stealing Ten Cents' barges in Pirate. Or how he saves Ten Cents off screen in munitions, after Ten Cents takes an oil barge out of the harbour before it explodes and nearly sinks him. Lights went out watering the engine. I didn't know if I could make it back, but thanks to Grampus I did. And in Regatta, when Lily Lightship is in danger of sinking, so he <clears throat> holds himself under her. He's also kind of a scary character to think about design-wise, as he always spits water out of his mouth when he comes to the surface implying every time he goes underwater, he has to hold his breath. Like, how long can he hold his breath? Does he need oxygen to survive, or does he just like having his mouth open under the sea? Because I don't mean to disgust you, Grampus, but fish can piss. 
All are very enjoyable characters to see on screen and are led by Captain Star, who also acts as the narrator for the episode stories. He recalls them as memories from his past and tells them as if he's sharing stories with a family gathered around his living room. I remember the day we got our first big break. It started like most, at dawn. He's also very serious and grandiose in his delivery and acts as a no-nonsense authority figure to his fleet if they ever get into an argument with each other. Again, we never see him or Captain Zero on screen as they both communicate through megaphones in their offices, but they're implied to be humans. Speaking of Captain Zero, let's talk about the Zed Stacks, the Z standing for Zero. They are the antagonists of the series, always trying to secure contracts before the Starfleet, or trying to scheme their way into earning from the Starfleet's contracts. Because the Starfleets are the most prominent characters in these episodes, there isn't as much to say about them, save for one which I will talk about after the others. Let's start with their main harbour tug and most recurring of the fleet, Zoran. He's the brains of the schemers, the one who pulls all the strings. He'll regularly bully the Starfleet and often tricks them into thinking he's being a nice guy when he's really doing something for his own benefit. See Sunshine when he causes Sunshine to slip up so he can try to earn a part of the Duchess towing contract. As well as Trapped, where he pretends to go and get help for the Starfleet who are trapped upriver when he really wants to use this as an opportunity to do their usual jobs, earning for his company. But he's not just the leader of the Zed Stacks because while he's definitely the most devious, he's also the one with the most common sense. He instructs Zack and Zebedee to go carefully with the munitions barges, and later tells Tencent to get away from the fire instead of going in to save Blue Nose. Okay, his engine's out, I'm going into hell! Don't be a fool, Tencent! Get out of there! He's right, move! And despite acting as the toughest and meanest, he's scared shitless by the ghost ships and insists on going into ports with Izzy Gomez, who he previously got annoyed with. Amigo, give me a toll. I pay what you want, any price you say. Uh, no, Izzy, my old friend. I'll tell you in for free. I need some company getting back to port. Uh, <laughs> he may be a schemer, but he's a wise guy at least. The next Zed Stacks I want to pair in a group of three, as I think there's not that much to say about them individually. Those being the Harbour Tug Zack and the two little switchers Zip and Zug. Zack is the right hand man to Zorin. He's not as wise as Zorin, so it leads him and Zebedee getting into mishaps when they try to get ahead of the Starfleet. In high tide, they take their barges down a canal in an attempt to take a shortcut, but the high tide causes their load to get stuck under the rail bridge, causing it to collapse, and that of course loses them the contract, all because of their big-headedness. He's definitely not leader material. Zip and Zug are two mischievous switchers who always follow Zorin's plans in order to win them contracts. Zug is the more naive of the two, and Zip is often the one to manipulate him into their tricks. All of the time, however, things never go to plan. The biggest example being in the finale where they trap Tencent and Sunshine in ports without realising they also trapped the light barge needed for when Lily runs out of fuel but they don't realise this until the SS Vienna is almost sailing past Big City. To which Zorin rightfully scolds them after risking them their fuel contract with the vessel. You idiots! We needed that light here, didn't we? To get Vienna in, for us as well as for them. They're definitely not the brightest of the Zed Stacks either. The last one to discuss is the other harbour tug, Zebedee. Like Zack, he's also a right-hand man to Zorin, who doesn't quite share the same common sense as him either. Once again evident when he and Zack destroy the rail bridge. You may be wondering, well, what makes him so different to the rest of them if he's just like Zack? I'll tell you. It's because he is the only Zed Stack out of the entire fleet to get a spotlight episode in this series. The episode High Winds focuses on him being put in a tricky situation as he's manipulated by an ex-friend of Captain Zero and a gangster tramper, Johnny Cuba telling him to bring him coal and keep him hidden in the docks. Throughout the episode, Zebedee also finds himself helping the Star Tugs in the windstorm after Tencent helped him that morning with one of his loose barges, once when trying to prevent Scuttlebug Pete from tipping over, and again when the Starfleets are struggling to dock the Princess Anne with her damaged rudder, where he rushes in and saves Tencent and Sunshine from being crushed, in what's honestly my favourite scene in the whole series. 
A Zed stack like Zebedee, normally perceived as a nasty, crooked show-off, breaks the mould and becomes the hero of the day. He may just be the most layered character in the series just from what this episode alone showed of him. It's why he's both my favourite Z-Stack Tug and my favourite character of Tugs as a whole. I I'm not kidding, High Winds is that great to me. There are recurring side characters of course, but they don't require as much discussion so I can just list a lot of them. There's Lily Lightship, who as the name suggests is the lightship out at sea for guiding vessels through the fog, and is also the show's prominent female character out of... all two of them. I mean, this was the 80s when it was filmed after all, I never said the series wasn't dated. Oh, 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 sorry, what's that? You're still not convinced? Well then, allow me to introduce to you Izzy Gomez. The stereotype. I don't need you dogs fussing around me all the time, okay? Ay caramba, he's a ghost! Mira, mira, mira! You guys is always trying to tell me I need a toe! Move out of my way, please! Hey, you guys, I need a toe. We don't accept bananas as payment. Again, definitely a product of his time. You have Lord Stinker, the garbage barge, who usually works with Warrior on garbage duty. Billy Shoepack, the alligator tug who loves explosives, or as I like to call him, David Mitten's self-insert. Blue Nose, the naval tug whose narrow-mindedness triggers the munitions fire. And you also have Puffer, the dockside steam engine. Who, by the way, had his engine chassis used on set of the first series of Thomas and Friends as the Marklin engine. Where was this Marklin engine? Well, anytime you saw a line of trucks moving off screen, that was the Marklin engine. Only occasionally was it ever caught on camera, as it was used to move rolling stock to make the yard feel busy. Sorry, where was I? Oh yeah. You also have Boomer. Okay, Boomer! The jinxed tug, who, because he had his name changed, becomes a jinx around the city port, and causes chaos wherever he goes. And you also have the dockside crane, Big Mickey, who, believe it or not, we actually see die on screen when the munitions cause his dock to go up in flames as he topples into the water as he sinks and dies. There we are! I'm dead clear! Big Mickey! And holy shit, you just have so many other side characters in this series. They really went all out with making the world feel alive with just the vast quantity of characters in the show. That's one thing I commend the show for the most. While Thomas and Friends was limited, in its first four series anyway, to only have characters from the Reverend Audrey's books, the production team at Clearwater Features had as much freedom as they wanted with creating these characters from scratch. I really like the Starfleet, I really like the Z-Stacks, I really like their rivalries and dynamics with each other, and I like whenever the reoccurring side characters are featured. Not everybody has notable character development like most of the characters in Thomas and Friends do, and not everyone is that memorable and just kind of exists to me. But the development they do get, mainly with Warrior and Zebedee, is awesome. Easily one of the most standout factors of this show. Speaking of standouts, what would I say is the defining aspect to Tugs? Well, to me, and I'm sure to many other fans, that honour goes to the production design. With a set consisting of a fleet of steam-powered tugboats, Clearwater Features was tasked with filming with working water effects, so the fictional location of Big City Port, which was heavily based on the harbours of San Francisco after Robert Cardona's visit there, was built inside a giant 37 metre deep water tank, complete with blue and green food colouring to make it seem deeper. 
David Mitten even decided one day to put goldfish in the tank to joke around on set, but accidentally killed them as the dye was toxic. <coughs> to ensure the boats could be fitted with working eye mechanisms and smoke machines to create steam, the props were built onto poles connected to a chassis that ran across the tank floor to steer them around. That way they wouldn't sink, and the boats wouldn't bounce around on the ripples of the water like toy boats were prone to do. I legit want to see someone make a Tugs video where the Tugs can't stop bouncing on the water. <laughs> like, I've no idea how you'd be able to do it, but any attempt I want to see. I love the visuals of Tugs. Not only were the props incredibly detailed on a scale far above what they had accomplished with Thomas and Friends up to that point, but the same effort was placed into the set locations, the explosions, oh boy I got all of the explosions, and that sexy, sexy cinematography. To me, the show looks its best when it's watching the tugs carry out their jobs from a distance. The wide angles mixed with the camera trucking, dollying, or remaining static allows you to take in the beautiful scale of their universe. You really do feel like you're standing at the side of the docks, watching these powerful machines glide across the ocean. To further emphasise my point, here are some of my personal favourite shots in the series. Absolutely wonderful. As is the music by Thomas and Friends composers Mike O'Donnell and Junior Campbell, which was there ever any chance they'd let us down? There's not really any character set themes, but there are familiar motifs used throughout the series that fit the cinematic scenarios the Tugs get themselves into. My two personal favourites being the theme of the Ghost Tugs. <laughs> And the danger slash rescue music whenever a tug overcomes an obstacle to save the day. <laughs> Further amplifying the dedicated design of tugs is the voice work. Unlike Thomas and Friends, which focused solely on one narrator voice to fit as close to the style of the books as possible, each character in the show has their own voice, and their dialogue just sounds so natural. Not just from the lack of a narrator going, said this character, or said that character, but because their voices were sound mixed to match the foley sounds of the environment. Their voices are edited to sound real. I'm going to do my best to describe this, so bear with me. In Thomas and Friends, not only was the narrator the only voice you heard, but nothing was changed to the voice to match the environment the engines were in. It's a very minute detail that you probably wouldn't pick up on during your first viewing of Tugs, but watching it back, you'll notice characters often have a slight echo in their voices, because they are all in a wide open harbour space with no walls to condense their voices. They travel great distances. So, instead of sounding like a bunch of people talking in a recording booth, it really does sound like they're talking at a busy harbour. Listen carefully and you'll see what I mean. OJ, they're gonna blow up Grampus! Who is? Blue Nose in the Navy. He said so, at 1400 hours today. I'll do something, OJ. Big Mac said you'd know what to do. On top of that, you also have the characters speaking in stammers, or quick breaths with natural sounding dialogue. The kind that doesn't sound like it's talking down to kids, but real people conversing with each other. The best example, I believe, comes from High Winds, when Tencent helps Zebedee. We don't need anything Star talks us to offer. 
Do it your own way, then. Uh, uh, wait, uh, hold it for me, will you? Uh, thanks. Uh, it also helps that the narration mostly doesn't over-explain everything, and either lets the characters explain what's going on, or just lets the action speak for itself. It's not perfect, sometimes the narration will talk over what we can already see going on right in front of us, like the log flow in Upriver. But overall, it works just fine. It should be worth noting that some of the instances of the narration over-explaining things were on the 15-minute cuts of the four episodes released in their 20-minute cuts, as previously mentioned, straight to VHS. The most notable changes are during the Duchess fireworks party in Sunshine. The Duchess threw a big party, celebrating her arrival in port, everybody enjoying themselves. Or this line added in munitions, trying to change the story as if Big Mickey survived by falling into shallow water. And lying in shallow water saved Big Mickey from both fire and explosion. Which I guess has to do with the changed episode order from the originally planned structure where Big Mickey appears in later episodes alive, as opposed to appearing dead. <laughs> The correct episode order of Tugs is a mystery that has been going on for years. As a casual fan who just watched the show for the first time recently, I don't feel like I'm in the position to try and piece together a consistent episode order. Nor do I care that much about it, as I feel Tugs can be enjoyed in any episode order. Uh, but back to the episode cuts, the episodes Sunshine, Pirate, Regatta and Ammunitions all had their 20 minute cuts released to the public, while the rest were limited to their 15 minute TV broadcast cuts. It is believed that all the episodes were filmed in their 20 minute intended format, and there is some evidence to support that. What with the behind the scenes photos and information as per the photo drive created back in 2021, on top of the additional photos and deleted scenes recently shared by the Tugs Trust. <sighs> but I am going to sound like the Filthiest casual when I say this next bit, but I think the 15 minute cuts work just f You got what you deserve, wanker. I don't mean the episodes where we saw both their 20 minute and 15 minute cuts, because obviously watching the 20 minute cuts first makes you realise you're missing out on something, as well as spotting out moments of clumsy editing. But with the other episodes, especially the ones I felt suffered from pacing issues, it makes me wonder if the extended editions would really add that much. Again, I say this as a casual fan who hasn't dived deep enough to behind the scenes information to see what was missed out. Like we know the 20 minute cut of Warrior exists as it's in possession of the Tugs Trust, but I don't feel like I need to see it if that makes sense. That doesn't mean I'm against the rest of the 20 minute cuts being discovered and made public, I'm all for lost media and production history being found. I'm just perfectly fine enjoying these episodes as they are. Speaking of lost media, let's look at where the franchise is today. So we know Clearwater Features closed down after its source of income, TVS, went bankrupt. All plans for future Tugs projects were cancelled, and everyone on the production team went back to Britt Allcroft to work on Thomas and Friends. A lot of the props used on Tugs were brought on to Thomas, just without their faces if they had one. Such as Izzy Gomez here, the Fulton Ferry here, OJ repainted here, and most famously on several occasions, Big Mickey, who would go on to be a regularly appearing crane at Brendam Docks, even into the CGI series, just not as his character. Until, believe it or not, in 2017 with series 21, he was given a face and addressed as Big Mickey, marking the first time a Tux character had been seen on screen in years. What? But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Around the early 90s, I want to say, all the Tugs props were left in David Mitten's storage unit, metaphorically pushing Tugs into obscurity. Years later, David Mitten passed away in 2008, and following this, his storage unit was emptied, and all the Tugs props were thrown into a skip to be taken to the rubbish tip. However, after a series of bizarre events, including most of the props being brought home by a builder, restored by a model restoration expert, auctioned on eBay, and then discovered and all bought by a group of members from the Sodor Island fansite, the Tugs Trust was formed. 
recently rebranded as the Tugs Exhibition, which is where they currently reside to this very day. Not every prop was found, boats like the Fulton Ferry are still yet to be discovered, but enough of the main props did survive thanks to a group of dedicated people. That's what makes the production design of this show all the more intriguing, and dare I say, beautiful. There is still information we're learning about it to this day, including the American dub pilot that was planned to sell the show in America. The audio is extremely muffled, but it's interesting to hear what was originally intended to be America's first exposure to Tugs. But what they got instead was Salty's Lighthouse, which, again, just no, I'm, I'm leaving it as it is. It's this production history and the grandiose boldness of Tugs that inspired the fandom to save the props from certain doom and preserve its history, even spawning various fan-made projects such as Tugs Continued, a fan-made continuation of the original series in script format, and Rescue, a fan-made audio-visual drama, as well as what I believe to be a fantastic example of the fandom's dedication, a complete recreation of the American dubbed episode, Sunshine, upon which several professional voice actors were contacted, and so much time was dedicated to getting the most accurate US-sounding dub as possible. Today I've chartered another switcher to help out with the extra work. Ten cents, he'll be working with you. Show him the ropes. You got it, Captain. So, uh, what's his name? Sunshine. Sunshine? <laughs> what, does he only work in daylight? Yeah, well, at least I'll do something around here, Top Hat. No, I do what's expected of me. All right, all right, calm down. Led by the big fan of the talking boats himself, the unlucky Tug. That's why the production design of this show is beautiful. Not just with how far it went to look as stunning as possible, but the impact it left on fans that made them want to continue on the spirit of the series that never got a fair chance. Keeping the series afloat, you might say. Boo! If this were a Thomas and Friends review, I'd go through my bottom five and top five episodes at this point, but considering that Tugs' episode amount is half of what Thomas and Friends got, I figured instead I'd go through my worst to best ranking of the episodes, just so it adds my own little personal touch towards the end of this review. So, starting from the bottom... Number 13, Quarantine. The sinking of the Fulton Ferry is pretty cool, but that's about the only thing I can remember whenever I think about this episode. It's kind of two stories meshed weirdly together. If I skipped it, I don't think I'd miss anything other than this one instance of Captain Star being a dick to Sunshine and Tencent for no reason. You know the scrapyard dealers are looking for useless tugs, don't you? Now next time you're late, I'll ask them what they'll offer for a couple of switches, understand? <laughs> that, that's pretty funny. But yeah, this is my least favourite episode. Number 12, Warrior. Originally I had this as my weakest episode, but over the time of me writing this review, I've gone back and watched the scene where he rushes in to rescue Izzy Gomez, and I've grown to really appreciate this episode a lot more. It's still kind of a nothing episode with not that much going on, but yeah, the scene where he saves the day ranks it above quarantine for me. Number 11, Sunshine. I think it's okay that the pilot episode isn't in my top 10. As a pilot episode, it well establishes everything we need to know with the characters and the world we're going to get used to throughout the series, as well as showcases the main story format. As an episode in general, it's admittedly not one I would immediately jump to to watch Tugs out of the blue. It's good, just not great. Number 10, Jinxed. And I feel like I've committed a sacrilegious crime by ranking this episode only just in the top 10. Boomer is honestly an interesting character and his titular Jinx leads to many funny disasters throughout the episode, as well as gives us this beautiful shot of him sailing away to the horizon. But I feel like the joke of him being a Jinx kind of runs a little dry at some points. It's an episode I feel like I can pass when re-watching the series, but it still has nice humour. Number 9, Big Freeze. While the first half kind of drags, once we get to night time and it's all about the Tugs trying to come up with a plan to guide SS Vienna into port, the episode picks up drastically. Hearing their back and forth banter and seeing their personalities clash is really entertaining for what is a grand yet simple finale to the series. Also, the ending lyrical song as Vienna sails away, short as it is, is beautiful as well. I would play it here, but, you know, copyright. Number 8, Upriver. 
A classic thrill ride from beginning to end, from trying to save a friend from being trapped in a pile of logs with fire spreading, to trying to stop the logs from flowing down river and tearing uptown to pieces. I am also a sucker for winter aesthetics as you know, so visually I am very captivated by this episode. Also seeing Warrior pushing the logs like an absolute unit is something I always look forward to see. Number 7, Regatta. All together now? There's no garbage today. What do you mean no garbage today? There's heaps behind you. No garbage today. That is all. Number 6, Ghosts. The Thomas and Friends' Ghost Train episode in Tug's form. A creepy atmosphere, bone chilling music, and such a visual marvel of an episode. The scene where the galleon rises from the melting ice with the face of King Neptune as Ten Cents and Sunshine look on in horror, it's completely bonkers yet so effective. Seeing all the Tugs' reactions to the ghosts is also a treat, especially in the case of Top Hat cowering in fear. Number 5, Trapped. Just a fun filled episode with the Tugs trying to. <coughs> trying to cough. Just a fun filled episode with the Tugs trying to work their way out of a blocked river and the runaway down the river's current as they make their way through, absolute pure joy. Another funny incident caused by Billy, David Mitten, Shoepack. Number 4, High Tide. A tension filled episode with Top Hat's shining moment, it develops his character from a selfish snob to a caring and hard working member of the fleet, which we all like to see. Wish we could have seen more episodes of him and Lord Stinker paired together. Number 3, Pirate. Mysteries, dark story elements, and a daring plan to help strangers in need. This episode has it all, and I don't just mean because we have its 20 minute cut. Great character interactions throughout the episode as well, mainly from Top Hat and Warrior waiting to catch the crooks. What's that name? Tactical. Um, it means thinking strategically. What's that name? Um, strategy over uh, what you said. <sighs> Tactical, you dummy. Tactical. Strategical. Give me strength. Positions, warrior! Get the double! Number 2, Munitions. The mass panic of everyone shouting orders at each other and trying to coordinate to stop the flames from spreading? All awesome. And is also the episode with the best use of pyrotechnics and editing in the whole series. And number 1, High Winds. Such a unique episode just by focusing on a Z stack for once with a gripping story. A shining moment for a character usually perceived as a nasty guy a threatening presence from the brief appearance of Johnny Cuba, and it really just feels different compared to all the others. Without a doubt my favourite episode of the series. Well, I've sung its praises and pointed out its flaws. Time to conclude this review with one important question. Is this show better than Thomas and Friends? Well, after analysing the series top to bottom, the stories, the characters and production design, I can honestly say that I think Thomas and Friends is better. Please, please, please hear me out on this. Tugs was so bold in everything David, Roberts, and the rest of Clearwater Features set out to do. They were ambitious and amphibious. From the length of its episode, to the wide cast of characters with detailed props, to just the sheer size and beauty of the sets and stunning cinematography. Without a doubt, the show outdoes everything Thomas and Friends had done up to that point. I repeat, it outdoes everything Thomas and Friends had done up to that point. Because regardless of its unfair handicaps leading to its cancellation, we still only got one series of tugs and even then, it wasn't perfect. The stories had inconsistencies in tone and realism as well as problems with pacing. Some characters feel considerably less interesting than others. At times the narrator is slightly overused and also, as brilliant as the music is, sometimes it can be too loud to hear what the characters are saying. Legit, I had to look up the transcripts of what characters say in certain scenes because it got that bad. This show would sink into obscurity while Thomas would later take what was learned from Tugs and improve upon it. That is what film and TV production crews do after all. I feel like it's easier for me to put on an episode or two of Thomas and Friends compared to Tugs. 
Not just because of its shorter runtime, but because it doesn't ask as much of me to watch it. It's a little bit of an unfair nostalgia bias, I know, but that's just how I feel. I've been watching the damn show since I was a kid for crying out loud. But, whenever I do decide to watch an episode of Tugs, I always really, really enjoy it. Hours of blood, sweat and tears were poured into bringing this world to life for our screens, and it more than makes up for the short existence. I'd seen reviews and videos talking about Tugs for ages before watching it fully for the first time, and for a show like this to win me over that easily is nothing short of remarkable. Maybe a lot of that is to do with how similar it is to Thomas, but who cares, I respect the hell out of Tugs. Not just for the risks it took, but it was because of those risks that my two favourite series of Thomas and Friends were as breathtaking as they were. I have been educated. I now understand why the look and sound of series 3 and 4 of Thomas was so beautiful. I see the sister series I can thank from the bottom of my heart for walking that tightrope and falling so that a little blue tank engine could stand the test of time. Series 1 and 2 of Thomas walked so that series 3 and beyond could run, but it was Tugs that ran so that Thomas and friends could fly. And if those words don't do it justice, then surely the dedication of its community that still talk about it and discover new information years after it was released, certainly will. David Mitten never got to see his passion project travel across the seas, but I believe we as a fandom have more than made his wish come true. surprised that my review of Tugs ended up being a very long video for this channel? Not in the slightest. It's great to be able to talk in depth about this show, and I wouldn't have been able to talk about it in the first place had you guys not helped me reach the milestone. At the start of this year I had just over 170 subscribers, and ever since I posted my Series 6 review at the start of this year, Everything that's happened since then throughout 2022 has been a phenomenal experience for my channel. I've way past exceeded uh, the milestones that I ever thought I'd set. I, I legit thought that I would only hit 500 subscribers at the end of the year with the rate my channel grew last year. And again, it blew my expectations. I reached 1,000 subscribers in less than a, two, three months. I gained a sponsorship with Kai Ki. Again, just so much more stuff that's happened uh, for my channel, and my videos gaining so many views and getting that recognition on the online Thomas fandom to a point where when I went to the Audrey exhibition for the very first time of uh, with me like going to an event with friends, you know, without uh, like family, you know, just venturing out into the unknown. Uh, people at the event recognised me, including the very guy who, who who inspired my Thomas content in the first place. That was fantastic. And... Uh, <laughs> again, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm... I should probably end this before I stutter anymore, but... Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and... I'll see you in a bit. Here's your duck.